So yeah. hello, everyone. This is Tim Harris, and this is the Harris Real Estate University's Friday Superstar Interview. Now, a quick review for those of you who are listening for the first time. What is the Harris Real Estate University Friday Superstar Interview? It's one or maybe two or three of three things. The first thing we like to do is we like to interview top producing agents, agents that are selling usually hundreds of homes per year. And recently, we've been interviewing a lot of Harris Real Estate University superstars that are selling four and 500 homes per year. We've interviewed the president of Keller Williams. We've interviewed the number one uh, agent with Century 21 last week. We interviewed the number one William E. Wood realtor uh, the week before that. We've got scheduled the number one Keller Williams agent, I think, in two weeks. And we also have scheduled two of the top five uh, REMAX agents in the world who are all Harris Real Estate University superstars. So this is a great resource for you to learn from the top producers. The second thing the superstar interviews are that we do every Friday is your opportunity to learn from a famous author. So what we'll do is we'll seek out somebody who maybe has written some books, somebody who has had some sort of uh, you know real estate-related uh, something that I thought you might benefit from. We've interviewed Pat Hyben, of course. We've interviewed some other people that have written uh, books recently that were geared towards the real estate community. And then the other uh, Friday interviews that we like to do are people that really don't fit into either categories. And as a lot of you know, we've interviewed some uh, fairly famous economists and folks that really aren't necessarily in the real estate industry per se, but we feel that what they have to offer will be beneficial to your real estate business. Well, I have to say, today's superstar, Mr. Jeremy Brandt, he kind of fits in all three categories. I mean, he's a very successful business person, kind of a famous entrepreneur, if you will. He is also somebody who's a bit of a celebrity. He's been CNBC and a lot of other um, I think major news outlets. He's somebody who I really admire, frankly, because he's never been afraid to say it as it is. He was one of the first nationwide to sort of call out the banks for their kickbacks that they are asking for short sales. And I think we're probably going to touch on that today because a lot of Harris Real Estate University students participated in that survey that I know Jeremy was able to base his information on when he was doing that reporting. So without any further delay, I want to welcome to the call Jeremy Brandt. Jeremy, welcome to the call. Thanks a lot, Tim. It's great to be here. Um, so, you know, we can jump right in and start asking questions, and I've, I appreciate you sending the questions over, and I read your blog last night. Actually, I'll tell you what struck me from reading your blog, and by the way, Jeremy, what is your blog? Uh, it's, it's very easy. It's just my name, jeremybrandt.com. Good. And, oh, you know what? We definitely should emphasize the fact that you own a company. Tell them what you do, specifically what your company is, and how they can get hold of you. And we'll talk about that. Uh, well, very briefly, uh, I own a company that I started about uh, nine years ago, and the whole purpose of this company is to connect distressed and motivated home sellers with real estate agents and investors. We do this uh, nationally and in Canada, and the best way for a real estate agent to get a hold of us and learn more about that company uh, is through a portal that we created for them called HomeFlux. It's H-O-M-E-F-L-U-X.com, HomeFlux.com. Uh, we have a couple of different brands that are associated with that, 1-800-CASH-OFFER, where we do a lot of our uh, PR and marketing, and uh, also FastHomeOffer.com. It's a consumer-oriented portal. So the essence of um, your interaction with agents and what you do with agents is that you do, obviously, a fair amount of, you know, a lot of lead generation, and then those leads, when appropriate, and we're going to talk about, again, I like the stuff you're writing on your blog about urgency and following up with leads right away. I thought that... I mean, it's like I was reading some of our own content on your blog. I don't mean that literally, of course, but it seems that you suffer through some of the same pains we do, you know, with regards to agents maybe not being uh, Johnny on the spot enough when it comes to follow through. So you, in essence, as far as your interaction with realtors go, you are a, a very, very effective generator of short sale listing leads. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I'd say about, uh, you know, right now we have about 10,000 home sellers per month that call us through uh, one of our channels. And about 50% of those uh, that contact us right now are short sale uh, candidates. So about 5,000 short sale candidates per month, and the other 5,000 kind of fall into um, other motivated category, categories, divorce, inherited property, that kind of thing, where people still have equity in their home and don't need to do a short sale. So you started out uh, before the real estate crash uh, focusing primarily on uh, investor leads, generating uh, leads for investors who wanted to, you know, owners who wanted to sell their houses relatively quick, and you migrated towards the uh, the distressed property leads, as it were. How does the di how is it different? How have homeowners' needs changed since the market blew up? What have you seen being the biggest difference or difference? Well, I, I think the biggest 
difference from um, from an agent and investor standpoint is just the equity position of most homes. Um, when we started back in 2002, um, my background is in technology and then also in real estate investing. And so that company uh, really came out of those two areas of expertise. And we were um, working with real estate investors. Our marketing message to the home seller was, we'll buy your house for cash. And uh, very quickly, we had lots of home sellers contacting us and lots of investors buying property that had um, good equity positions. Uh, but as the real estate market changed, as you know, those equity positions disappeared, both through um, people refinancing at a crazy rate on their homes and taking a lot of home equity loans out, and then also the decline of the real estate market, them just losing property value. And so now most of the home sellers that contact us just aren't a candidate, even if they want to sell their house for cash to an investor, they aren't a candidate because they don't have enough equity in their home for an investor to make the spread they need. And so a couple of years ago, we really transitioned to working uh, primarily with real estate agents across the country. And it's a very unique uh, proposition that the agents can make to the home seller because the home seller, um, they're contacting us for a cash offer. So they're not out shopping agents. They're not talking to 100 different agents. Um, they're really looking for a cash offer for their home, which means they're highly motivated and ready to do something now. And uh, we have a process that we walk agents through on how to convert that home seller from uh, I need to sell my house for cash to that's not going to work for me to what is the best option for them, which is listing their house with an experienced agent who understands short sales and understands the distressed property market. Well, I'd like to talk about your, um, as we call it, your intervention process. I think it would be very interesting for everyone to hear. You know, intervention in the same way that maybe if someone has a substance abuse issue, you get them in a room and you, with, you know, surrounded by loved ones that are there to, ready to tell them the truth no matter, you know, if they want to hear it or not, and then take them through the recovery process. I mean, isn't that in essence what you're describing as far as bringing someone to the table and making them realize that their situation isn't what they thought and their, their problem might be a little bit more dire if they don't list an agent and know how to do a short sale? Well, very much so, and, and I think today more than ever, real estate agents have to know that they're in a consultative business, that they're, the, the primary value that they bring to the home seller is um, the consultative ability they have to look at the situation, provide them with what the best options are, regardless of what the home seller thinks they want. So we all know that a lot of home sellers think their house is worth one thing and it's really worth another, or think it's going to work one way and it's really going to have to work another. And so agents have to get very good at being consultative and leading a home seller down the path to the best option for them um, without, you know, telling them they're crazy or, or being rude or, uh, you know, a lot of things that uh, we hear agents do sometimes. So it is a very consultative process, and it's, um, it's a, a difficult process sometimes to tell somebody their house is worth a couple hundred thousand dollars less than they think it is. So when you're telling your uh, your users, your subscribers, I don't know what, how you label them in your business, but the agents that are basically working with you on the leads that you're generating, how do you go about uh, telling them how to counsel those underwater owners into the fact that, guess what, you're underwater and we have to do a short sale? Well, you know, my philosophy in business um, has always been uh, you have to meet your customer where they are. So you can't force your customer, your potential customer, into your box. And so one of the things that we really tell real estate agents to do when working with uh, the home sellers contacting us is the home sellers contacting us for a cash offer. And it, you know, if they're contacting, uh, if an agent's being contacted directly, um, the home seller is usually telling you why they're contacting them. This, them. So this applies to any part of your business, but in our business, uh, the home seller is contacting us for a cash offer, and so it's really important for the agent to meet that person where they are, which is, I want to sell my house for cash. So we really coach agents on. Uh, when they first contact that home seller, and we'll talk in a minute about the criticalness of speed of contact, but when you first contact that home seller, um, it's very important to give them that cash offer. And so most agents, when they call up that home seller, they say something along the lines of, uh, you know, you've just contacted us online to sell your house for cash. Looks like your house you think is worth about $300,000. Um, an investor is going to pay about $170,000 cash for that home. If that works for you, then great. I'll facilitate the transaction, and we can probably get it closed in 7 to 14 days as long as there's no title issues. Now, that's kind of the reality check setting in for that home seller that uh, investors don't pay cash and 100% of market value to buy homes. Um, some home sellers think they do, uh, but the reality is they don't. They have to take 50 cents on the dollar, 60 cents on the dollar, up to 70 cents on the dollar to buy a property if they're going to write a check for cash. And so... Once the home seller realizes that that is what a cash offer is, then their mind starts going down the path of, well, what are my other options? And the agent is on the phone to work them through that process. 
Uh, so if the cash offer doesn't work for them, then usually they some, say something along the lines of, well, I'm an agent that specializes in selling distressed homes quickly in today's market. Uh, I have a lot of expertise in this area and in this uh, location, and here's what I can do for you. And then talk about the unique selling proposition, the value proposition of, of you and his agent, and then giving that home seller the option between selling for cash and listing with you as a real estate agent. Uh, because one of the things just psychologically about sales is people – uh, are much more likely to work with you if they have two options to choose between versus only one option that you give them. So if you say, here's my product, take it or leave it, you're going to get much fewer customers than if you say, I understand you need help, here's the two options I have for you, which one would you like? Now it's not a yes or no proposition, it's an either or proposition. And um, just from a psychological sales standpoint, consumers much prefer that type of presentation than a, than a yes or no presentation. Well, so what you've just addressed was a question that we had in the webinar, basically. Someone was saying, well, if the buyers or the sellers are accepting a cash offer and then you come in there and talk to them about a short sale, is now a little bit of a switcheroo. And the fact is that it's not because you're starting and you're, you're counseling your subscribers to start with the cash offer. And, um, of course, it's not difficult to find an investor that would be willing to buy a house for, you know, as you said, 50 to 60% off. Um, so bottom line here is is that always start your interaction with the owner, uh, you know, basically, as you said, meeting the customer where they are, and if they're looking for a cash offer, don't just jump right in and start talking about short sales. You might be surprised. You know, Jeremy, on a quick side note, agents don't always have to jump right to the short sale. When they meet an underwater owner, depending on how much underwater they are, you need to ask that owner if they want to do a short payoff versus a short sale. And a short payoff, essentially, you know, oftentimes the process is similar to a short sale, but the ramifications are the owner's credit isn't damaged. So, I mean, Julie and I used to do this a lot when we sold Ohio, uh, real estate in Ohio, is if you had a seller that was maybe ten, twenty, or 30000 upside down, and they didn't want to take themselves out of the housing market for a couple of years, and they didn't want to affect their credit rating and the rest of it, well, then they would just agree to pay that upside down amount back to the lender over time as an unsecured line of credit. Kind of, you know, the old way short sales were done. But, again, agents out there listening now and listening in replay understand that not every underwater owner has to do a short sale. There all are alternatives, and don't force them down. As I like Jerry just, Jeremy just said, give them one or two options. Mr. Owner, can you pay this amount of money back? If you can, guess what, agents? A deal like that where they can pay and will pay part of the money back over time that is a heck of a lot easier to close than a normal short sale where you're asking multiple investors, lenders to take a loss. Jeremy, lead follow-up, so important. Uh, you know, I, I can give countless examples. I'm sure you can too. So share with the listeners the importance of lead follow-up. <laughs> uh, well, I, I could go on for hours about this. This is basically our business yeah. is, um, you know, we have, 10,000 people a month contacting us. We refer those people out to agents and investors. Uh, and so we are uh, constantly analyzing um, the performance of our network and, and how many uh, homes turn into listings and into appointments and into sales and all this stuff. Um, and so we've done a lot of research into this, and then other companies um, have done a lot of research into this. Uh, and every bit of research shows that you dramatically, by factors of hundreds of percent, you dramatically increase your likelihood of working with a customer if you call them back within one minute of them filling out a form, especially on the Internet. So if somebody contacts you over the Internet, and this is a true across the board, if it's uh, you know through one of the online uh, real estate portal sites like uh, Zillow or Trulia, some of those, if it's through your own website or if it's through uh, a company that's generating leads such as ours, no matter the method of contact, um, if you follow up with somebody within one or two minutes, your likelihood of doing business with them skyrockets. If you wait 30 minutes to an hour, the likelihood plummets. Um, and we work with agents all the time on this topic and investors because the natural, as an agent and investor, your kind of natural reaction is to follow the path of least resistance. And the most resistance is pick up the phone and call and immediately interact with that home seller. The least resistance sit in front of your computer and do a CMA and pull up some information, pull up the tax rolls, and kind of get all your information together before you call them. Well, all that time that you're taking to put your, your information together, that home seller is sitting in front of their computer, and what do you think they're doing, right? They contact you through Zillow, let's say, but you haven't called them back, so what are they going to do? They're going to call the next person on Zillow, and they're going to go do a Google search, and they're going to call somebody else. Um, 
And so it's, it's so critical to call people back immediately. Um, we coach uh, our agents um, that the only thing that you need to look at when a lead comes in is the phone number. Nothing else matters. It's that phone number to pick up the phone and call them. Everything else is secondary. And in fact, um, this became such a critical issue for us in our business that we implemented technology where we uh, call the real estate agent when a lead comes in. So when we have a home seller contact us, we feel it's so critical um, that, that um, they get on the phone immediately. Uh, we have technology in place so that the second a lead comes in, our computer system calls that agent and live transfers that home seller to the agent within one or two seconds. Uh, so the agent is basically forced to talk to that home seller unless they're on an appointment or you know, somewhere where they can't answer their phone. And we've seen our conversion rates just skyrocket by implementing those, um, those types of systems. The other statistic, and again, this is true across the board for anything Internet-based, is that 87% of consumers do business with the first person to call them back. So you can assume that if a consumer is contacting you online to sell their house, they're probably contacting a couple of companies if they're doing it through an online um, source. Um, and so what happens is if they're going to do business with somebody, so if they're not a tire kicker, if they're going to do business with somebody, 87% do business with the first person to call them back. Not the most qualified person, not the best person, not the most experienced person, but the first person to call them on the phone because everybody after that is playing second fiddle. Once you engage them uh, on the phone and tell them that you're going to solve their problem and how you're going to do it, everybody else that calls back gets voicemail and they don't get their calls returned and they don't get their emails returned because that consumer's found somebody who's going to help them and they're off to the races with that solution. So that's true with all Internet businesses, not just real estate? Because I know that's true with realtors because um, most consumers perceive all realtors as the same. They don't really differentiate one from the other. After all, everyone's a realtor and everyone has a license. They all must have you know, similar qualifications. But you're saying that same matrix actually branches off into other Internet-related businesses? Yeah, across any Internet-based lead. So you know, our, our kind of world is the world of lead generation. So there's been a bunch of uh, studies that have been done with, 20 million leads across all industries, so real estate, insurance, mortgage. Uh, if you think about all the different types of industries that really rely on Internet-based uh, contact, um, across 20 million leads, the, uh, the statistic was that if you call somebody within one minute, you have a 391% better chance of doing business with them uh, than if you wait a couple of hours to call them back. And for every couple of minutes, that percent goes down by 100%, and then over hours, it starts to drop off dramatically. And there's also been some studies that show um, how many times you should follow up with a consumer. So, you know, the rule is uh, a lead comes in, you call them immediately within one minute. If you don't get them on the phone for some reason, you should call them back uh, in about uh, an hour. And if you don't get a hold of them, you should call back in about four hours. Uh, and so there's this process that, based on 20 million different leads from different industries, um, how to engage with a consumer and ensure the highest level of conversion uh, possible. So if you're going to spend all this money on SEO and pay-per-click and leads and you know, whatever else you're spending your money in on to bring a lead in, um, we so many times see people spend tens of thousands of dollars in marketing to bring a lead in and then completely bungle the, the lead follow-up process on how to really engage with that person and make sure that if they're going to do business with anybody, they do business with you. You and I could talk, I'm sure, a month straight about this very topic because it is interesting. At the end of the day, you know, a lot of agents that have really great first years, there's a lot of agents that we have that will have, you know, they'll be the top agents or one of the top agents in their offices. And then the second year, they're not so good. They kind of have sophomore slides. And it's interesting when you get into their heads and you find out what the difference was, and it all comes back to the word that we're talking about now, which is urgency. You know, the urgency of getting back with those people. And what happens is we convince ourselves that we're busy doing other things, and then lead follow-up falls way down the road. You know, lead follow-up becomes something else that somebody else does. You know, lead follow-up becomes something else that your team does. And then top producers start believing that their, their buyer agents are going to be in charge of lead follow-up. It's In this type of real estate market, more than probably the past real estate market, lead follow-up being done by, you know, if you have a team, your rainmaker, or if it just, the bottom line is, is whoever's calling those leads back has to call them back immediately and then use a script. You know, a lot of agents will use the excuse, well, I just don't know what to say or I don't know how I'm going to answer these questions or give them a script, answer the questions. You know, I'm sure you have a script that you suggest they use when they're calling back the folks looking for a cash offer. And obviously, guys, all of you who are involved in one of our classes, we give you scripts to use too. But 
it really cannot be underemphasized, the importance of fast lead follow-up. Fast lead follow-up, you heard Jeremy say it, that is the secret sauce if you're looking for something that's going to really give you an edge. And fast lead follow-up, when you call that lead back right away, what's the message that you're telling that potential client? You're telling them that you're you're telling them that you're motivated. You're telling them that you're organized. You're telling them that you're interested in helping them. You're telling them that all positive things. But it's sort of interesting, Jeremy, again, when you get in the heads of realtors, which we do every day as a coaching company, um, you know, you ask them, well, why don't you do fast lead follow-up? Well, I, you know, I always like to call my leads back at the end of every day. They don't remember that they called you any more than maybe 10 or 15 minutes after that initial dial. But what's more is what's the message that you're actually telling them, the fact that you took so long to call them back? that you're not organized, that you don't put emphasis on helping people right away, all negative. So if you really want to get down to the essence of it, why agents don't do fast lead follow-up, I think it's really a lack of preparedness, lack of organization, and maybe a lack of an understanding, which hopefully you and I, Jeremy, kind of underscored that on this call, of lack of the understanding of that being really the secret sauce. Have you studied in your business, Jeremy, the agents that are you know real efficient? Now, I'm sure now that you have this automatic uh, automatic follow-up system, by the way, just on a quick side note, because I had two people ask me this question in the webinar, is that a home-built system, that system that automatically calls leads back and connects, or is that something, a third party? Uh, it's a bit of both. So um, it's the back-end processes are uh, built by a third party, and then all the front-end um, is built in-house by our development team. Okay. All right. So moving forward here, let's talk a little bit about running a business versus a having a job. You know, running a business versus having a job, that was a question that you suggested we talk about. What does that mean to realtors? Well, I think real estate, um, uh, realtors, real estate agents um, are very unique in that almost all of them start out uh, as kind of independent contractors, an individual doing all of the work, uh, and there's a there's a giant learning curve into becoming a business, right? So if if you're a one-man show and you do all the work, uh, what you have is a job. You don't have a business. A business is made up of systems. A business is scalable. A business runs if you leave for a month and money still comes in. Um, and so uh, you, when you look at really, really successful agents and you analyze their operation, their operation runs like clockwork if they decide to go take a month and travel. Um, they have systems and processes in place so that when a lead comes in, it's followed up immediately by one of their team members. When um, they get a hold of somebody to talk about a listing or a sale, they've got those scripts in place that, like clockwork, it's done the exact same way. They have their finances in place that are managed so that uh, everything is done in an orderly and replicatable manner. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things that I talk a lot to agents about is really about how to go from you do all the work to thinking about everything that you do in your day and which of those things you could hire out to an assistant or hire out to somebody that can do it so that you can focus on the highest, highest value part of your business. Um, and I think that's really, a lot of agents struggle with that because a lot of them don't have a business background. And so they, they come from other uh, jobs, uh, become a real estate agent because they have a passion for it. And, um, uh, and so it's great to see people that go from being an individual real estate agent to really owning a business where it's a, a system that runs whether they're there or not, and they're really providing strategic direction and working with maybe the highest value clients with you know very large properties uh, or investors that are buying lots and lots of properties. Uh, and you know really what it comes down to is building systems. So if you build systems in your business, uh, you can hire people to run those systems for you, and you can scale your business up to doing you know, you said you'd interviewed people that were doing hundreds of transactions a year. Um, I guarantee all of them have those systems in place. You couldn't do a couple hundred transactions a year if you had to think about how am I going to interact with this person, what kind of paperwork am I going to bring to it, you know, what's my process. If you have to reinvent the wheel every time you do a transaction, you cap yourself out at, you know, 50 transactions a year, 60 transactions a year. That's that's about right. That's what we've seen too. And, you know, the old rule is basically after, you know, people always ask when should I add my first assistant in the in you know back in the bubble is probably well after you've closed you know a certain number of transactions for two months in a row and I think the the rule was like you know seven or eight at that point you you're hopefully consistent enough that you can afford to take on a staff member but now what we suggest is 90 days of doing consistent volume and then you add a staffer but the irony of it is uh, Jeremy nowadays you can add virtual staff people um, we're interviewing somebody who owns a virtual staffing company specifically geared towards realtors working in the distressed end of things I don't know if 
maybe I should connect you guys as well. But he uh, he has a, a team of Filipino vil, uh, virtual staffers that work for agents for like it's cheap, really inexpensive. Mm-hmm. And the feedback I've gotten from a lot of my top I I found this guy, I discovered this guy from a lot of our top producers that have been using him for the past six to twelve months and had nothing but great things to say about him. So anyway, side note, you and I will have to get back together on that one. So you see in your business, agents uh, start out by, you know, obviously they're buying the leads from you, and you're seeing that the leads, that the agents that do well are the ones that follow up the fastest, or right now you've got this bot, basically, that will connect the very motivated seller with the agent instantaneously, basically. What's the other, and you're talking about the fact that agents then can build their business, and they realize that adding staff members and systems, uh, when it financially makes sense, is obviously the stepping stone that top producers generally follow. That's kind of been the historic path the past 20 years or so. What are other, I think, what are other kind of secrets? What are the things that you've learned or observed that top producer, top producing realtors are using tools-wise in this market that maybe is a little different than the past market? I don't know if that's kind of a convoluted question, but I bet you you understand. Uh, yeah, you know, so there's there's a, a couple of things um, that I'll maybe uh, use to respond to that. I think one is um, nothing that's new, but it's just become more critical. So in in every industry, uh, and especially in those industries that are becoming commoditized, and I would argue that um, it's not a commodity yet, but but real estate agency is becoming commoditized. So it's further along that path than it was 10 years ago. Um, Can you explain that, Jeremy? Yeah, so a commodity business is one that, that competes mostly on price. Um, so there becomes less and less differentiation between um, uh, between the services that are offered. Now, there's definitely different experience levels with uh, between real estate agents. So I'm not saying that they're all the same, but the reality doesn't matter. What matters is the mind of the consumer. And as you said earlier, in the consumer's mind, most real estate agents are about the same. And so even though we know that's not true, you're dealing with a, a psychological situation where real estate agency is becoming a commodity. Consumers are mostly comparing based on price. That's probably the primary factor that they're looking at initially. Um, and so it becomes very hard to compete. And so uh, one of the things that you do in a commodity market as a business, and if you analyze other types of businesses that have become commoditized, you'll see this over and over, is uh, to become more efficient. That what really becomes critical is the efficiency of your operation, um, because if your margins are getting pushed down, uh, you have to make it up on volume. So you can take a slightly smaller margin if you become more and more efficient and do a higher volume of transactions. And so one of the things that we're really seeing a lot of agents doing is just leveraging technologies to drastically increase the efficiencies in their business. Certainly one aspect of that is companies like ours where we uh, generate um, home sellers that are looking to sell quickly and are very motivated. Uh, Other things that we see a lot of is uh, automated follow-up techniques. Um, So a lot of times you'll have a home seller not so much from our system, but you know, from other, uh, from through your website or maybe somewhere else, where they're not ready to buy or sell yet. They're kind of tire kicking. That person comes to their system. You talk to them, and they're not ready to do something, but they're going to do something in six months. Um, there's a lot of great uh, automated follow-up systems out there where you can stay in front of that consumer and on a very kind of personal conversation with them, but it's 99% automated through email and notifications and. Uh, it'll reminders to pick up the phone and call them and just check in with them. Uh, and those things can be done through technology that before it would have been impossible to keep track of 500 different people that are in some stage of a pipeline that may list their house in the next 24 months. Um, you just couldn't do that with pen and paper before. It would, be, it would take a massive amount of, of human capital. Now there's very automated systems to do that. Um, things like this automated call uh, technology, uh, any piece of technology that helps you do your job better and makes you more efficient, um, I think is what we're really seeing, a big shift in, in real estate agents and, and people that own larger real estate brokerages. Well, and also uh, the old rule was basically work within a niche, and you know, that's still true. Being a niche player obviously works. You just have to you know study ahead of time whether the size of that niche that you're focusing on is going to be large enough for you to accomplish your goals and really take the time to study who your competitive competitors are. You know, it, it's interesting also um, as we watch this uh, market continue to evolve or devolve, however you want to say it, that it's really becoming very, very segmented. I mean, you're seeing an enormous group of owners or would-be owners that are now deciding to be long-term renters. But also when you get calls from sellers, it's not like it was, you know, even five years ago or six years ago. It was, 
you know, is this seller, what's her motivation? How soon do they need to sell? It's all the sort of the traditional motivation questions. And now it's so much more complex. You have to find out, okay, are you upside down? Aren't you upside down? What's the nature of your, you know, there's so many more questions, so much more expertise that's required. That's not just on the seller side either. You look on the buyer side, and you've got all these buyers with all these complex issues, and financing is becoming more difficult, and you have all cash buyers. And, you know, and I like what you said as far as the efficiencies too, because, Average sale price. Well, this is something that Marty Rodriguez said, you know, the number one Century 21 agent in the world. She said, back in the bubble, my average sale price, she said this to me in the pre-call, she said, was six, $700,000. And now it's dropped down to less than half of that. Um, and so we have to do more transactions in order to maintain the same margins. And that's something that mentally a lot of agents struggle with. And, Jeremy, businesses like yours that uh, take a lot of the – I don't know, sometimes onerous and costly lead generation, um, you know, parts of any successful real estate business and takes that internally and the where an agent can just buy the leads basically. It's how, I'm not sure how your – how does the money worth, uh, work in terms of uh, working with your company? We'll have to maybe cover that because I am getting some questions about that. But it just makes sense, agents, to work with a company like Jeremy's because it does provide for you um, leads. And if you're listening to the type of leads that his company provides – they're the most motivated seller leads. These are sellers that aren't just raising their hands. They're raising their hands and jumping up and down saying, help me. Um, and, again, go back to what we were just talking about. If you call those guys back right away or, you know, you let Jeremy's bot basically connect you with them, then that allows you to get in front of that customer the quickest. And if you're then knowing how to help them with their various challenges in real estate, um, you're going to get a sale. And that's really basically how it works. You just have to be more urgent, more businesslike, and, and at the same time, more of a counselor and maybe less of a salesperson. So I liked all those aspects of what you said, Jeremy. Tell me about, um, and we'll jump right back into the structured questions that we have, but how does someone do business with you? Because we are getting a lot of calls about that. Actually, and Jeremy, I have to read you some of these compliments too. We're getting a lot of people that are existing clients of yours that are very complimentary of the service that we're getting. Actually, I'll read this one. This is kind of funny. Nathan from San Jose, he said, wow, Jeremy's people call me back within one minute from the time I registered on his home uh, homeflex.com website as an agent. That's impressive. So a lot of other nice little com uh, compliments about your service as well. So how does someone do business with you? What is what is their experience going to be, and what are the costs associated? Um, yeah, the um, so the the way to do business with us, just like real estate agents, we're a consultative business, so we want to make sure that um, we get the right agents uh, in our network. Um, we you know the. When, when our system doesn't work, it's because people aren't following up quickly or they're a part-time real estate agent. Um, and so we really want to make sure we get the right type of person um, to, uh, to work with in a particular market. So the first step really to work with us is to go to that website, homeflux, H-O-M-E-F-L-U-X.com. That's our portal for real estate agents. And you can uh, just fill out a contact request form. And if you fill out that form, you should get a call back uh, pretty quickly if we have uh, a couple hundred people do it at once. It may take an hour or so to get back to you because I don't have uh, 50 people working here in my office. But uh, we'll get back to you very quickly because we preach the speed of follow-up is critical, and so we want to do that uh, the same for our customers. Uh, and we're going to talk to you about your business, what you're doing, the volume of your business, uh, what type of motivated home sellers that you're already working with, explain to you our process, and then see if it's a good fit for both of us. Um, I'm very anti-high-pressure uh, sales. I really believe that it's a consultative process and either it works great for both parties and everybody's happy or it doesn't and we shouldn't be doing business together. Uh, and to that end, um, in our business, we have no contracts. Um, so anybody can join uh, as long as they qualify and we, we kind of vet them. Uh, anybody can join and leave at any time. We don't expect to uh, keep somebody around with a contract. Uh, and the way that our program works is uh, really just a per contact fee. So we have two different pricing structures, $25 per contact, or $75 per contact exclusively, so it's 25 or 75 per contact. And then you set up a monthly budget, so we'll connect you with you know, 10 or 20 contacts per month, depending on uh, how many people that you want to work with. Uh, and, of course, with us, uh, every contact that comes in, because speed of follow-up is so important, is, contacted, is connected in real time with the real estate agent. So within one or two seconds of a home seller uh, calling into our call center or filling out a form on one of our websites, uh, the agent is getting an email, a text message, and a phone call uh, to connect them with that home seller. And so we're, we're very, very fast in, uh, in that speed of, uh, of follow-up with the agent. And then from that point, it's up to the agent to work with the home seller, identify their situation and the best solution to it, and, um, and hopefully convert that into a listing. 
Uh, most of the really experienced agents in our network end up converting uh, about 25% to 40% of the home sellers that we connect them with into a listing. Uh, and then about, uh, I'd say, 2 to 4%, 2 to 5% of the home sellers who contact us end up selling their house uh, to a real estate investor. So we still have a lot of people with high equity positions contacting us that um, that we refer out to an agent who can then uh, make them a cash offer and connect them with a local investor. Or if the agent doesn't know a local investor, we have a huge network of national investors that um, we can uh, get a cash buyer in there immediately as long as as long as that price is right. Uh, and the, well, the other big clean, difference about I, us is, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I love how clean it is. I mean, your system is very easy to understand. There's no long-term contracts. You know, we got away from contracts a couple of years ago, too, because really at the end of the day, I mean, you know, a contract is there to hold somebody to something that may, they may change their mind about six months from now. And you're saying, listen, I know I'm going to perform at the highest level for the whole duration of our relationship. I expect you to do the same. And that's the understanding. That is all the contract that's needed nowadays. I like how clean the numbers are in terms of this is how much a lead costs. This is, and you can set the budget with how many you want per month. Um, and you know, very, very nice. I like it. Uh, yeah, and you know, the other the other thing that is really critical to me, which is why we have set it up this way, is um, you know, I believe, especially in industries like this, you are only as good as your reputation. And so we really want to make sure that we're a fit for people, and that uh, when we find the right real estate agent. We do everything that we can to make that relationship work. So we're going to ensure that, um, you know, on the front end, we're going to work a lot with them to make sure that they understand how to work with the home sellers, that they understand how the process works. We're very kind of consultative up front and, you know, probably lose money in the first couple of months. But our goal is to really build long-term relationships. We have people that have uh, been with us for five, six, seven years, and it's really because I think we try to build that long-term relationship where everybody's happy and everybody is, is successful. The other thing that we do that really differentiates us, you know, one certainly is is our value proposition to the consumer that, you know, contact us to get a cash offer for your home, um, which very few people are doing out there. And so it brings us a lot of consumers that aren't going to the real estate agent websites because they think that's not the right solution for them, even though it is. Uh, and the other thing that we do is we only do um, demand-driven marketing. What do I mean by that? That means that everybody that comes into our system as a lead is somebody who has contacted us directly to sell their house for cash. So what we don't do is do outbound marketing, which is contacting people on Craigslist, contacting people on for sale by owner sites, doing a lot of this, uh, hey, would you like to sell your house kind of stuff. Um, that brings in a lot of volume, but that's very, very low quality. Everybody that we work with has contacted us directly through, um, you know, we have, I don't know, a couple of hundred different channels of marketing, from Internet-based marketing to TV to radio to billboards, uh, and then, as you said earlier, we do a lot of work um, through PR with the national media that brings us a lot of home sellers who see us through that channel. Uh, but they're all contacting us. We're not reaching out and pulling them in. I think that's a big differentiator when you're talking about motivation level of the home seller. Well, it changes the nature of the lead, right? It changes the nature of the relationship between that potential seller and the agent. This, the seller was going to you and knowing that they're going to be connected with an investor or an agent that really does change the uh it changes it versus an agent cold calling and asking for the business um so that is a very powerful differentiator i think with what you're doing with what everybody else is doing too and really jeremy as far as the cost per lead that's very affordable i'm sure you've studied your competition but a lot of them charge that are you know this aren't doing the exact same thing as you but they're charging sometimes three and four times the same amount um i remember well we won't mention any names of companies but i think that's very reasonable and if you can if your successful agents are closing, say, four out of ten, converting them into listings, no, you, what was the number again? How many are they converting in, leads into listings? For the for the experienced guys, it's twenty-five uh, percent to thirty-five percent. Okay, so if you get ten leads and it costs you two hundred and fifty bucks, and basically you let's say you're you're only okay and you only convert one, and let's say in your marketplace that average commission is going to work out to be. Roughly six thousand dollars. That money makes sense where I come from. If you can show me where I can invest two hundred and fifty bucks today and get six thousand dollars back in say six months, I'm going to do it. <laughs> you know. So yeah. That's, you know, again, one of the got, things that, and one of the things that you probably spend a lot of time talking to agents about, and we certainly do as well, is that it's um, especially as you go from kind of having a job to running a business and building uh, an enterprise, thinking about that sales funnel and really, really understanding what it costs you at every level. Uh, you know, we'll talk to agents sometime. They'll say, I never pay for leads. 
says, okay, that's fine. We don't, you know, we don't want to do business with somebody that doesn't want to do business with us. But then you start digging into what they do, and they're spending huge amounts of money uh, advertising on other websites up front. So not paying for leads, but they're paying for advertising. They don't even know what it costs them to generate a lead off that advertising. Or they'll spend five hours a day prospecting on Craigslist, which essentially values their time at zero um, if, uh, if they're not paying for leads. Uh, and so it's really important to understand whatever form of marketing you're doing, whether it's SEO or paying for ads on websites or paying for leads, what does it cost you to get a lead? What is your conversion rate for that lead? So what does it cost you to get a listing? And then ultimately the most important metric of all is what is your return on ad spend? So how much money did you make in commission compared to all the way at the top of that funnel, how much money you spent overall for that marketing source? And you can very quickly determine is this something that's valuable or is, am I wasting my time uh, spending money on, on this uh, marketing source? And surprisingly, most agents don't have a really good handle on what those numbers are and couldn't tell you what it costs them to get a listing in their business. Agents that say, and I don't honestly, Jeremy, I don't hear hear this like we used to, but and, and I hopefully you're not hearing as much as you used to too, because it really is a myth. You, you know what you said. I, I don't buy leads. I mean that was almost like a a, bat, a badge of honor, right? You know I go out and I'll prospect for my fizzbos or expireds, and they almost like throw their noses up in the air for you know agents that were buying leads. But you said it. You are buying leads. You're just exchanging your time. It's more of a direct correlation between your time and the results that you're getting. Everybody buys leads. Everybody has to pay either with their time or with their credit card at some level to generate business. That's just the way it is. And, well, I get all of my leads from my centers of influence and past clients. All right, well, tell me exactly what you do to build those and foster those relationships with those people. Well, I spend every weekend volunteering for this and working for that. Okay, so there we go again with your time that you're spending. You know, again, getting back to the idea that the business model has shifted, the mindset of top producing agents, and if you guys listen to these superstar interviews every week, you'll see it's virtually completely parallel, or I mean, opposite of the way it used to be. It used to be we'd get really great salespeople, really great salespeople who are, you know, very extroverted and they're very, I don't know, almost, you know, gregarious to the point where they're, you could barely keep them on the phone. They're so bouncy. But now what we're seeing is business people. We're seeing people that understand scale. We're seeing people that understand the idea of, you know, hey, guess what? Buying leads if the numbers make sense. And that's that's what Jeremy's offering. And I think, Jeremy, that's what you said vastly more eloquently than me. So I appreciate that. You know, it's interesting as far as – but really, Jeremy, none of this works. I think it's worth emphasizing this again. All of this is just a bunch of wasted money and time if the agent's not being really efficient on that lead follow-up. I mean, that really is the essence – I think maybe the, one of the most important points that we've brought out during this interview so far. Call your leads back, not 10 minutes from now, but immediately. You know, that is a priority in your life. The only time that should be distracted, or the only time you won't maybe want to do it, I can't even think of a time you won't want to do it. Maybe if you're in the middle of a movie. I, I, I mean, can you think of a time, Jeremy? It's that important, isn't it? Well, it is. And, you know, so there's a couple of uh, kind of uh, funny anecdotes about that is that um, – yeah, if we you know if we uh, talk to a real estate agent and um, and are kind of talking about our program and how it works, and it becomes clear that you know they're a part-time real estate agent and they kind of do this uh, in their off time, or even worse, if we call them three or four times and get voicemail every time we call them, um, it's it's just not going to be a good fit because I guarantee that the program is going to fail. And any lead generation program, whether you're you know doing it on your own or you're paying somebody, is going to fail if. Um, that speed of follow-up is is not there, and so one of the uh, maybe one of the more interesting uh, things that we got out of implementing this technology in our system is we can tell uh, how fast or if people are are uh, taking that phone call. So when our our system calls an agent and the agent doesn't answer the call, um, you know we get a report, and so we can go back to the agents and say, you know, we sent you 50 calls of people that we're on the phone ready to sell their house right now and we're looking for an offer and all 50 calls you answered three of them. So maybe this isn't the, you know maybe this isn't the right fit for you if you've got more business that you can handle or something is going on in your life maybe we just shut this down because now we have empirical evidence that that those calls went out to you and they just they just weren't answered and so it's it's so well, so me, critical Jeremy, was, let, let let me jump in here just for a quick second, okay? Because what you're talking about is accountability, and I think, Jeremy, this might be useful for you too and everyone listening. Accountability from a third party is what our industry has seen that agents are 
experiencing maybe for the first time in their careers. When you're listing short sales, when you're doing BPOs, when you're you know listing assets for asset management companies, and every one of our students knows this, Jeremy, you are being scored. Quite literally, you're being scored. They are keeping a literal score on you inside, say, for example, ResNet. Asset managers will or won't decide to put more assets with you based on your score. Guys, the, the short sale and the REO worlds are merging now. If you don't have the ability to do both, Okay, you're not going to probably get any assets or if you know how to be, if you're like I'm thinking of Michelle McClintock in Florida, right? This gal closes, I don't even know, 20, 30, sometimes more short sales per month. When she has a short sale, she gets to the head of the line because the negotiators inside these banks know who she is and they're going to give her and guess what? She's now getting assets from the, you know, REOs from the same companies. Guys, everything in the real estate industry is being tracked. Earlier last year, and guess what? I know for a fact it's happening right now. Fannie Mae is going out there and checking on those of you who have Fannie Mae assets. Remember, your listing, your REO asset might be through a third party, but it's actually owned by Fannie Mae, so you might not be listing Fannie Mae direct, but you are listing a Fannie Mae asset. They are what they call shopping you. They're checking on the asset. They're looking, they're calling to see if you're answering the phone. When they're calling, they're finding out how long, just as Jeremy and I have been saying on this call, how long it takes for you to call them back, call that lead back. They are literally testing you, okay? Jeremy, he might start doing business with you, but if you aren't efficient, if you don't essentially meet the grade is what he's describing, they're going to nicely, I'm sure, counsel you that that's not a good fit. Because guess what? If you're not doing a good job following up on the leads that Jeremy's generating from his uh, website, you are essentially making his business look bad. And he understands that. Now, he's being very nice in this call, but in the back of his mind, he doesn't want a bunch of uh, homeowners thinking, well, I went to that website, no one ever called me back. That's where his focus is, and he's looking for people that have that same mindset. Again, getting back to the fact that the industry has totally changed. It's now about business people that have the skills, and yes, you have to know how to counsel almost more than sell. So I thought I'd throw that in there. Sorry, Jeremy. <laughs> no, I can tell you're very passionate about it. Yeah, I am because you know the truth is is that I it breaks and I mean this with all sincerity it breaks my heart and Julie's heart and our coaches' hearts to see agents that could do it in this business but they have these absolutely positively uh, arcane beliefs about the real estate industry and as a result of that they they're absolutely suffering and that is just sad because these are small business owners. People that got into the industry initially with the best intentions, uh, and then what's happened is basically the game's changed, and they're still trying to do business the old way, and they're wondering why they're experiencing so much lack, whereas so many other realtors, realtors, I think, Jeremy, that have adopted the mindset that I think you so elegantly portray on this interview, those guys are doing fantastic. I mean, there's agents that weren't selling two houses back in the bubble. Now, they're selling hundreds of houses. Has anyone else besides you and I noticed this change, Jeremy? Yeah, very much so. I mean, I think, um, you know, there's one of the interesting things about business is that there's not a lot new under the sun. It really comes back down to the fundamentals. And so you're right, people can get tied to the old way of doing things um, and get, a, a get stuck in the rut. But really, you know, most of the stuff that we're talking about is just a little bit new take on what people should have already been doing and what a – blazing hot housing market disguises is um, a bad business model. So, you know, it used to be that you could throw a stick and make a couple hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars in real estate uh, and not be very good at what you were doing because there was just so much demand in the market. And now that the market shifted, it goes back to those business fundamentals, right? Having a very strong marketing pipeline that's consistent, having a very, very strong follow-up process that is systemized that you know every time a call comes in, that person is going to get followed up within five minutes, and here's what we're going to do, and here's how we're going to do it. Um, being experts in, you know, whatever the current real estate uh, market is and what's going on in your area, none of that's really changed from years ago. Those were always critical things. It's just years ago you could still operate as an agent because the speed of the market disguised the fact that the business model wasn't good, and so um, and so that's one of the things that I think everybody in the real estate industry has really had to do is go back to those business fundamentals. You know, as a business owner, I tend to do this, and I think most people tend to do this, is look for that silver bullet that is the thing that's going to make everything great, right? That one secret that if I just had that one secret, 
uh, I would be a great real estate agent or I'd have a huge business or I'd have whatever. Um, and the reality is there is not a silver bullet. It's basic business principles repeated over and over and over again with consistency that's the differentiator between multi-million dollar producers and people that are struggling to make it work. Well, repetitious boredom pays off. That's what you just said. Being willing to do the same thing over and over again, understanding um, that the business, a successful business isn't about drama. There's not real high highs in a successful business or low lows. It's basically the same thing. Day in and day out. You know, you guys are essentially making Model T's or hamburgers or whatever it is. But that's really, when you listen to these interviews, agents listening to this in replay, pay attention. The fact is, is that a successful real estate practice nowadays, if the drama, it, it can't be there, right? So the drama of the big sale, the things that people used to really celebrate in the old market, the top producer that got the $5 million sale, you know, those types of things, they happen, but they're very rare. The agents that are making the fortunes now, you don't even hear from them. You know, I try to pull them out to do these interviews on Friday, but some of them are like, I'm too busy. Or here's the other thing I hear a lot, Jeremy, and I frankly, I, I respect that, what they say. They say, I don't want the attention. I don't want the attention. I don't want agents calling me. I don't want, you know, the real estate machine trying to make me into something I don't want to be. I'm in this business to make money. I'm in this business to help people. I'm in this business to build my personal wealth, and that's all I want to do. So that's the different mindset that we see entering into the business versus before it was all raw, raw, and dance on your chair. And, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You, you've seen all this, too. Yeah, very so much. I you know, uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, I have a question for you. So I see you on CNBC, you know, like our friend, friend Sean O'Toole. Every time they talk about real estate on 60 Minutes, well, there's Sean O'Toole, the expert, you know, from Foreclosure Radar. So how do you go about garnering this much press attention? What are you doing? Uh, you know, it's um, it's going to be embarrassingly simple um, what we do to get a lot of that media attention. And I'm um, just like you, uh, I am um, uh, have seen all the rah rah in real estate, and I'm very much not a rah rah type of person. Um, but especially coming from the real estate investing world, where nobody wants to be on camera because they think everybody's out to do a hatchet job on them, um, we saw just a big vacuum in the market for people to provide um, well thought out expertise on what's happening um, that's different than, you know, a talking head. Um, a lot of these talking heads on, on television just, I mean, you've seen them. They don't know what they're talking about. Um, there will be all kinds of factual errors that come out. And so um, so we really felt like um, there was an opportunity, one, to, to provide a real service to the real estate community, which um, is good for us. And then, two, of course, that promotes our business, uh, which is ultimately, uh, in the long run, good for us. Uh, and so Really, the way that we have built um, most of these relationships is by, uh, surprise, surprise, just helping people. Uh, so when a real estate uh, reporter uh, or somebody on one of these shows uh, needs help with an article or needs help with something, uh, we are happy to help them with research, connecting them with agents in our network, connecting them with investors in our network, uh, and providing help to them so that they can write their story without, and this is the critical thing, asking for anything in return. Um, you know, most people... Uh, that work with reporters and work with the media are sending press releases, and most reporters get hundreds and hundreds of press releases a day, and they're just ignored. Unless you're a Fortune 500 company, the vast majority of press releases are thrown right in the trash. And so our strategy has been uh, build a relationship with people. And um, reporters are going to write about companies they know. They're going to interview companies that they know. And uh, if we have uh, been out there helping them find solutions to uh, the story that they're trying to write, uh, when it's time to write a story about uh, an area of expertise that we have, they're going to give us a call. And there's been many, many stories. In fact, we did one recently where we provided 80% of the content for a story and uh, didn't appear, our name didn't appear in the story, and we weren't mentioned. And that's okay. Um, you know, that's kind of part of our strategy for working with the media is that if we provide value first, um, then everything else will follow. And that's really is what led to some of these great appearances that we've had on, you know, I was interviewed by Larry King a while back uh, before he went off the air, and we've done Fox News and CNBC. And uh, even that uh, story that you alluded to earlier about the uh, bank fraud, that was a story that we brought to CNBC, uh, and we didn't ask for anything in return. We didn't demand that they do a story on our company. We said, here's something that's happening in the industry. We've got the evidence to prove it, and we think this is a story that is, is interesting and needs to be told, and let them run with it and own the story, but ultimately – um, you know, we were interviewed for it, and um, and it led to a lot of business for our company, 
but it was because we were unselfish about that process. If we went out demanding to be written about, um, you know, you'd never get a call back from a reporter. Well, that's the same approach that we, and I'm sure you do as well, tell your agents to basically approach owners with, right? How can I be of service? How can I help you? Have that be your prominent approach. And if you don't necessarily have your cup filled as a result of that immediately, that doesn't necessarily mean it won't be eventually. So, you know, Jeremy, it is kind of interesting, I think, uh, as we kind of wrap up this interview, for them to uh, – that that whole big kickback thing that was happening, I, you know, I'd almost forgotten about that because we don't hear about that happening anymore. But Jeremy, on you know, behalf of somebody that teaches agents how to do short sales and coaches literally thousands of realtors around the country, you know, sincerely thank you for bringing that to light because that was becoming an absolute – I don't even know – I can't even – the only words that popped to my mind are – words that my wife would 100% scorn me for saying during a live interview. But it was just horrible what the banks were doing. And I think that practice kind of went away about a year ago. But, Jeremy, you know, to your credit, man, it sort of went away within about 60 to 90 days after all after you helped break the news about it. So for agents that don't know what we're talking about, Jeremy, tell them what was going on. Yeah, it's, um, it's pretty simple. And, and the way that it came to our attention was we had one of our agents who was a customer who – had been uh, talking to us about what was going on and asking us what she should do. And, and uh, we, we basically said, I can't believe that that's happening. Record all those conversations, which she did. And sure enough, it was going on. And, and so that's kind of how the story came about. Uh, but basically what was happening is in a short sale situation uh, where the, uh, the real estate agent is negotiating with a first and second lender to, to discount those loans, uh, the second lender would demand off HUD kickbacks in order to approve the short sale. And you'd say, well, why would the second lender do that? Well, because if you've done short sales, you know that the first lender is, is in the primary position. They've really, they're going to get most of the money that comes out of any short sale situation on a house. The second lender doesn't have a lot of leverage in the deal other than just to say no. They're, they're not going to um, get a lot of money. The first lender is not going to let the second lender get a lot of money. They want to approve the short sale and let the second lender get um, a lot of money. And so second lenders were kind of in the situation where they, they were in second position. They knew they had to discount their note down to almost nothing in order to uh, sell the house. And they didn't like it. So they started pressuring initially home sellers and saying, well, you got to pay down your loan by uh, $10,000 and then we'll approve the short sale. Once you pay down the loan, then uh, we'll approve the short sale. And that's well. What you um, mean by you pay know. down the loan? What what you mean by pay down the loan? Let's let's make sure we're using really black and white terms here. Is you need to cough up some money. You need to basically well, pay us. Yeah. Well, so that's so that's kind of where it started, and then it got a lot worse, right? So if a if a lender on the up and up said, you got to pay down your loan, so write a check to pay down the loan, and that lower loan balance is going to be reflected on the HUD statement. That's one thing. But you know where, where this went is um, the second lenders were saying. You don't pay down the loan. You write us a check that is FedEx to our office that isn't applied to the loan balance so that on the HUD statement, it still shows that full loan balance, and then we'll approve the short sale. And the reason they had to do that is the second, as the first lender would never approve the short sale if they knew that the second was getting paid off. So the first would block it if they saw that payment show up on the HUD. Um, and then they started going to the real estate agents. And this recording that we, that we ended up having, which is on our website, and you can listen to it, this recording was of the um, loss mitigation department at the bank telling the agent that she needed to come up with the money to pay and that it couldn't be on the HUD statement because if it was, the first lender wouldn't approve the loan and otherwise the house was going to go into foreclosure. So the second is basically holding everybody hostage and saying, you've got to make a payment, but the other parties in this transaction can't know about the payment because if they do, they're not going to approve it, which is where it goes completely sideways legally, right? If you're trying to get payments outside of HUD, that are tied to that transaction, that gets really illegal really fast. And so that's what was happening, and, um, and that's what we uh, brought to the attention of CNBC. We actually did a survey of, I don't know, 20 or 30,000 agents in our network um, to see how prevalent this was. Was it just, a, just a, a loss mitigation person that was off their rocker, or was this prevalent? And amazingly, it was very prevalent, and, um, and we heard from almost every uh, agent that had seen this with almost every – major bank. Most had said they just had to let the deal foreclose. Of course, some agents ended up paying money out of their own pocket to let the transaction go through because their commission was going to be more um, on the deal than what they ended up paying the bank. So it was a bad situation all around. And I think um, the CNBC story really did help put an end to it 
we got contacted by um, New York State Attorney General and a couple other states' attorneys general uh, after nice. that story and kind of helped them put some stuff together. Of course, they never tell you where it goes, but as you said, the practice seems to have stopped or at least slowed down considerably, so hopefully it made an impact. Yeah, well, I mean, they were trying to basically make agents uh, participate in what really is an illegal activity. As Jeremy just said, RESPA violation, everything that's, you know, every party that's getting a proceed from a transaction has to be on the HUD. So, yeah, well, that was, that was, was that over a year ago? It seems like it was a long time ago, but I bet it wasn't that long ago that that was happening, was it? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I, it might have been in January. It's a... Uh... I don't know. I think the, yeah, the story is up on our website, so you can go, you can go and, or on my blog. If you go to jeremybrandt.com, you can kind of see the whole story. And we've actually got copies of the recorded conversation, I think, on there that you can actually listen to the agent and the loan officer talk to each other. Well, I actually, Jeremy, I think that a lot of our students submitted to you, students that are in our short sale coaching program, submitted to you actual letters where the seconds have actually put it in writing and where they wanted to, you know, we became quite convinced that the people that were actually getting sometimes these little, you know, 1000 or $500 amounts, they were actually the negotiators trying to get themselves a little bonus because they always asked for that little, you know, kickback at the last minute to approve the short sale. So, yeah. Anyway, so thanks for stepping up and taking the bullets on that one and making that problem go away because, man, those those were challenges to work through, help agents counsel them and coach them to work through those types of problems. Jeremy, lots well, and lots of agents. Thank you very much for, for helping with that story. A lot of your, uh, as you said, a lot of agents uh, that you work with helped us when we were putting that story together. So it was a it was a team effort, and I definitely appreciate it. Sure. So, Jeremy, a lot of people want to know how they get hold of you. Um, they want to have your, I mean, I have, I don't know, 30 or 40 people here that are asking, Martha Washington from Cerritos, California. Jeremy, would you please repeat your website phone numbers? Samuel from uh, Union City, he's asking a question about wholesaling. Um, let's see, a lot of other questions. Here's Bonnie from Encinito asking about uh, how they get hold of you, lots of other things like that. So let's very clearly tell them how you want them communicating with you. All right, so the best way to contact us if you're a real estate agent is through our website, which is homeflux.com. That's H-O-M-E-F-L-U-X, homeflux.com. Or you can call our office. Uh, our toll-free office number is 888-424-4722. That's 888-424-4722. And if you contact us either through that phone number or through homeflux.com, um, through homeflux you should get a call back. Hopefully immediately, but it might be a little bit longer if we have a whole bunch of people contact us within the next 30 seconds. Uh, but I promise we'll get back to you uh, today and talk with you about what you're doing and um, help you in any way we can grow your business. So everyone that's listening right now, everyone that's listening live and everyone that's going to be listening in replay, I want you to immediately contact Jeremy. And, oh, by the way, it, just in case any of you are curious, I'm going to ask Jeremy, that, Jeremy, are you paying me anything for this interview? <laughs> no, I am not. Jeremy, are you paying me anything for the people that sign up with you as a result of this interview? Uh, no, we have no affiliate relationship at all. That's right. And, guys, I don't do those types of things because I never want you to question why I'm bringing somebody like Jeremy to the table. Listening to Jeremy, longtime Harris Real Estate University students, you must be thinking to yourselves, huh, he seems like he's a Harris Real Estate University coach because he says a lot of the same things that we've been saying for years, and that's the reason I like this guy. He's professional, he's honest, he's ethical, and the service he's providing I believe in. So, Jeremy, I want all of them to call you again, and your 800 number is? It's 888-424-4722 or homeflux, H-O-M-E-F-L-U-X dot com. Good, and pay attention to how his lead follow-up system works, guys, and, and uh, copy it. Because actually, Jeremy, I'm going to be sending you an email after this call asking you more about that auto callback thing because I like that idea for our company. So, uh, Jeremy, anything else you'd it. like? Well, I'm going to ask you. So, <laughs> Jeremy, anything else uh, that you'd like to say to the agents listening now and in replay? Anything else you'd like to put out there? I mean, here we are and what's now being called, I don't know if you've picked up on this term, but the Greater Depression. You know, we're obviously we're in this housing market. It's going to be in the doldrums for, I would say, probably a long time. You can quantify a long time as five years, ten years, depends on where you are in the United States. Is there anything you'd like to say to the agents out there listening? You know, hopefully we didn't come back, come out a dour at all, guys. The fact is Jeremy and I are very optimistic, but we're optimistic for the agents that get it. 
We're optimistic for the agents that are willing to treat their businesses like businesses, learning to, willing to learn the skills necessary. And I love what Jeremy said. It's so true. You have to approach every single relationship with every single person you come in contact with, not what's in it for me, but how can I be of service to you. Offer before you ask. Offer before you ask every time, and you'll be amazed how much the world opens itself up to you. So, Jeremy, anything you'd like to say to the folks listening? Yeah, I think I would, I would just uh, echo what you said, that um, I, I think we're definitely in a depressed real estate market for a considerable period of time, but um, I think that people should view that not as a bad thing um, for their business, but as an opportunity, right? If you look back through history, the greatest wealth has always been created in times of the most turmoil, right? So you hear about the wealth when everything comes back, but all those foundations are laid in times of turmoil. And so what's happening now is the, uh, the market is shaking out those kind of professional business people, real estate agents that are going to be the core of the recovery of the economy when real estate starts coming back from those people that are kind of part-timing it or just picking the low-hanging fruit and don't want to work hard. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very excited about the next five years because I think that there's a huge opportunity in the real estate market and those that are methodical and thoughtful and strategic about what they're going to do over the next couple of years are going to come out the other side um, much wealthier than they are now. Well, well, this is and Jeremy, that what you just said, so true. This is an opportunity, guys, to make more money through helping more people than you probably ever will have in your entire life. And uh, the, it, historically, the, the fact that he just said there's more opportunity to make wealth when everyone else. What, what is it? Uh, Baron von Rothschild, right? He said, "When there's blood on the streets, buy real estate." And uh, you know, Warren Buffett, a value investor. You know, these types of mindsets. The 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 mindsets, guys, are the wealthiest people in the history of history. It, it always comes down to make money when other people aren't. Focus on the opportunities that other people don't see. That's what this call is about. That's what this opportunity for you is about. You got to take the action, though. That's the bottom line. Can't do it for you. So, Jeremy Brandt. I want to sincerely thank you for being this week's Harris Real Estate University superstar. I loved interviewing you. You have uh, an absolute depth and breadth of information, which I truly admire. Um, and, guys, remember, your action step now is to call Jeremy directly. That number is? It's, uh, 888-424-4722. All right. So on behalf of Julie, myself, and all the faculty and staff of Harris Real Estate University, Jeremy, I want to thank you for being this week's superstar. And for all of you listening in, this call will be available for replay on the blog, realestateinsidernews.com. Um, and if you need us for anything, contact us directly. You can get us on the blog, or you can call 866-422-9497. Have a wonderful weekend. There. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Thanks, Tim. It was a pleasure being here.